welcome you all to 12th Man Studios. I'm Will Johnson. This is another edition of The Beat. Over the weekend in College Station, Texas A&M played host to the NCAA Indoor Track and Field Championships. Fantastic competition was on the way when the meet started on Friday. There simply would be a lot of power and speed on display. And plenty of it would come from the Aggies. Audie Wyatt, he produced a second place finish in the pole vault. And Will Williams was the runner up in the long jump. In the 400 meter dash, Fred Curley won the event and his brother Malik was third. And Lyndon Victor produced points in the heptathlon. All of this scoring led the Aggies to the final event, the 4x400 relay. The drama and theatrics were only beginning as the stage was set for a finish for the ages. Texas A&M sitting at 36 points. Florida at 37 and a half. The Aggies had to beat the Gators in the finale to pull off their first indoor title. And they're off. From the inside, it is Penn State, then Alabama. A&M in five, Florida in six, and in five, it is Fred Curley, the 400-meter champion, third fastest all time. By the way, Dwight, there's been a change. Robert Grant is due to take the baton from Curley here for A&M, and it is Robert Grant. 44, eight or nine unofficially is what I saw. What a leadoff. Remember, the team title's on the line. A&M must finish ahead of Florida to win the team title. This place is crazy right now, screaming and yelling and standing. This is gonna be close at the finish. You wait and see. They're gonna close down on clock at least a little bit. Listen to this crowd. It is deafening in here. required no words, but everything on the line. Little Curly runs a smart, determined, intelligent race and brings AM home with the title. They had done it. A new meet record in the 4x4 and an NCAA team title. Well, Coach said we're going to come down to the 4x4 and give my dude every inch and that's what we did and Malik just finished strong. It's, it still hasn't sunk in. I'm still kind of shocked like as you can see I lost my voice screaming at them because coming into this meet everybody had us as the underdog and today we just proved that we're better than that. I've always won individual titles and this feels really good. This feels better than any individual title that I've ever won and I'm happy that we got to do it in front of um, all our Aggies. My points were just a part of the bigger plan, man. This was a huge team effort by everybody, man. We came out here and we worked our butts off to win this thing. And I feel like all of our hard work has paid off and we we're ready to go to outdoors and win another title. The Aggies are indoor national champions. What a performance by the 4x400 relay team. If you want to see more of that kind of action, remember in 2018, next year, Texas A&M hosts the NCAA Indoors again. When we come back on the beat, we have both Curly Brothers and Pat Henry in studio with us. The Beat, brought to you by ASCO, your place for case construction equipment in Texas. Well, you just saw it, quite a finish to the NCAA Indoor Championships right here in College Station, Texas. The 4x4 relay team comes through and the Aggies hoist the trophy as national title winners. We have members of our men's track program with us right now. Please welcome head coach Pat Henry, Fred Curley, and Malik Curley, the brothers Curley, who were so instrumental in that race to close it out and claim that championship. Coach Henry, I want to start with you. First indoor title for your program. You've won four men's outdoors, four women's right. outdoors. First indoors, what did it mean to you? Well, it, it's a different championship than the outdoor championship, and, and we recruit for an outdoor team, but uh, we're good enough in these indoor events right now that we're able to win this track meet. So 
you know, it's a great victory, a great win for this group of young guys and uh, old guy. To win it is, is truly a, a great accomplishment for this group. Well, I'll go to the Curly Brothers to kind of take me through this 4x400 four that closed out the entire meet. It was an epic finish. But Fred, it started with you. You ran the lead, lead leg and you had already won the 400 meters as an individual. How did your lead leg feel as you worked through it to start that race? Oh, um, our coach was talking about at the beginning in the back where the football stadium at. He said, get every inch to my uh, teammates and that's what I did. Once you hand off, it's kind of interesting for a guy that starts it. You've got to wait another two minutes before everything comes around and finishes. What's that wait like after you pass the baton on, watch the rest of your teammates run? The wait is something serious because you get nervous, then you get excited, and you get nervous again. Then when my little brother finishes, I just have to go run and tackle him on the back end of the home stretch. Gotcha. Back and then Malik, stretch. you are the anchor. So getting into the mindset of the race again, you have to wait for a different reason. Mm -hmm. You see the teammates go around and it's coming to you at the end. What does your weight feel like knowing you're going to close this thing out? Uh, I'm always patient with everything. I don't really get too nervous. I don't get too excited. Uh, whenever it's my time to go, I'm always prepared to go. Um, sometimes it might be a little bit more nerve wracking whenever we're like behind, but at the same time I know what my job is and that's to finish the race every time. I think about three quarters of the way on the anchor leg, you had some distance between you and Florida's guy with it to make up. You still feel good about your chances even though you trailed some uh, late in the race? Well, I've seen like those positions like many of times and we train for that stuff every day. And especially training with Fred, like you train for those kind of things and you're behind a lot and you just have to learn how to push it out. And no matter what the distance is, you always have to have your mindset of is this, I'm gonna win the race no matter what and who's in front of you, whether it's Florida or any other school. I'll ask Coach this too, but to either of you Curly brothers, how much did the atmosphere mean to you during the 4x400 at the end? Well, I'll say uh, at a time I had to run versus it, and it's like crazy. It's like, wow, the, the atmosphere is crazy whenever you're running versus it, but whenever you have it on your side, like that's also amazing too. And for me, I don't really believe in like a, a home, like an environment to where you have an advantage, but to me, at the end of it, I was like, okay, maybe it is a little bit of an advantage, <laughs> a slight advantage, because the crowd there, I feel like any track meet that I've been to, I've never seen an environment like that, from the, the, the USA environments to anything. Like, that environment was crazy. The packed house, everybody on their feet, like, that was, like, it's A&M. Like, it's, it's a love for it, you know? Coach, it was great stuff in Aggieland for two days, that, that environment. No, uh, I, I have been to, to an awful lot of indoor meets. I won't say how many against. <laughs> but I've been before you guys were born. But, but I've been to a whole lot of them. I've never seen an atmosphere like that anywhere, any time. Everybody was on their feet because it was such a, a dramatic finish to a, to a track meet. Great stuff. A lot of what we will remember around here in Texas a and for a very long time. Congratulations, Coach Henry yep. and both Curly brothers. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Henry, Fred, and Malik Curley right here on the beat. Texas A&M 2017 Indoor National Championship. For the 12th consecutive year, Texas A&M women's basketball is in the NCAA tournament. Selection night was on Monday, and they found out their assignment for the dance. Welcome back. We have their head coach, Gary Blair, with us in studio. And, Coach, the draw you got, you're a five seed going against the 12 pin on Saturday night in Los Angeles. Thinking about what you face out there in L.A., how do you like the pod and the first round opponent? Well, I love the pod. All we do is we think about the first pod that we're going out to L.A. It's a good matchup for us. Uh, Penn, we've never played before, uh, but I'm very familiar with the Ivy League because I have played Princeton and Harvard before and Brown before at a different school. But, uh, but I want to make sure people understand the Ivy League is a very good basketball league. Mm -hmm. In 1998, when I was at Arkansas, Harvard, we were at Stanford, 
Harvard upset the numbers. They were 16, upset the number one, and then we had to play Harvard in the second round, which we won, and then we went on to the Final Four. Mm -hmm. But I will never, ever overlook an Ivy League team. <laughs> it has to be asked once the selections are made. You're going into the most important time of your season, the NCAA tournament. Where does your team stand? How do you like the state of this squad at the moment? I think first our team is very proud of themselves for living up to our expectations, not the expectations of the media or the coaches or the polls or anything, but we lived up to our expectations. And when you're at Texas A&M, you're in the playoffs. That's what we expect. Uh, you never have a spring break. Uh, I tell them when I recruit, I said, you better enjoy it in high school because we're playing in the playoffs every year. And then this team also wanted to make sure that we've been 11 straight years, 12 is a magical number around Texas mm -hmm. A&M, and we wanted to make sure we hit that 12. Now, it's going to be interesting next year when we hit 13. <laughs> we started a new tradition here. There you go. In your past experiences in the NCAA tournament, what are some of the keys you lay out that if we do this, we can stay in this bracket a while? Well, the key to a point guard is to dissect the other team's defense. The other thing is make everybody else around you better than they are. Put the ball in the pocket passes where you can catch and go straight up instead of having to reach and turn and then create your shot. And Curtis is one of the best I've ever had. And she's a quiet leader. The other thing that we've got to do is, uh, like we've done all year, stay injury free. We've got six that are in our rotation right now. We have some other kids on the bench that are getting better. But normally you want to play with that six. A lot of people have seven or eight. And that's basically all you need in the playoffs because you got a day in between rest. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to go in with our six, we're going to be ready to play. And I think each kid has something that they're going to add to the team. We've got shooters, we've got drivers. We got Kyla inside, we got Andrielle who's gonna clean the glass. Mm -hmm. So everybody has their separate role as well as the coaches in their preparation to get us ready for this tournament. Well, thanks so much for the time, Coach. Congratulations on another bid to the big dance. We're going to LA, gig them. <laughs> Saturday night is first round action between Texas A&M and Penn. The B, brought to you by Memorial Hermann, official sports medicine partner of Texas A&M Athletics. This weekend in College Station, Aggie Baseball hosts the Kentucky Wildcats and it starts SEC play. At Olsen Field at Bluebell Park, it's one of the finest atmospheres in the country for our national pastime and several traditions are on display. One of them is capturing fans across the collegiate landscape. If the visiting pitcher cannot find the strike zone, the A&M faithful will let him know about it. You can count on that. To keep an opposing pitcher off track, the Aggies track his wildness. It's a good feeling. I mean, it's, you know, certainly a home field advantage. I, and. I don't know that I can go back and tell you when that originated or when that started. But that's one thing, uh, especially here the last couple of years, has, has been really important to us from a, from a suffocating the opponent standpoint. I've seen that so many times, and I have seen it bother pitchers. I, I've seen the infielders call timeout and go over and try to settle him down because he's overthrowing, and, and pretty soon everybody's involved with the problem, and then, so the problem just emerges and, and gets larger. So it's, it's a little bit hilarious. It's sad, you know, at times, but uh, it's good humor. I'm definitely feeling for that picture for sure. I mean, to have almost 7,000 fans just yelling ball five and it just gets louder and louder and louder. I mean, 
When I pitched, when you struggled, you definitely didn't want to hear anybody talking. But when you have 7,000 fans, I think it's pretty definite. I definitely feel for those guys because I'm sure they have nightmares about it. I just think, thank God it's not me out there. <laughs> I mean, it, that's tough. But just, I, mean, I don't know how they're able to control that. Take a deep breath and pray and pray you throw a strike. <laughs> What do you tell someone who can't escape it? I don't know what I'd tell him. I, I know there were moments before I was at Texas A&M that, that we would have to talk to our team on Thursday about what they were in for and everything above the, th the first base dugout what was our concern, making sure that you didn't look up there, you didn't acknowledge them because if you did, they, they were going to get after you for the rest of the weekend. I, I feel like I just have to go try to, you know, make a make it Joe, try to get his mind off it and just tell him to relax. I hope the catcher's got a funny story to tell him or something, you know, to get him off of this thing. But um, no, I don't know. I had never thought about it. Never thought about what I would say to him. It's all part of Olsen Field at Bluebell Parks. Magic. They're into every pitch and they understand baseball and that's one of the special things about the stadium. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, our fans are with us no matter what. They're always there for us. Yeah, I think the, the 12th man's a big part of what we do, you know, it doesn't matter if we're up a lot or we're down a lot, you know, they're, they're kind of into the game quite a bit. I've had a chance in 41 years of Division I, uh, you know, from Arizona to Mississippi State to here, so I've been on all, all sides of it and just about every big ballpark there is. Uh, I think the best engaged in the game and the atmosphere is without question Texas A&M. Get to Bluebell Park this weekend. Don't spectate, be a part of the action. Texas A&M and Kentucky, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the confines. Back in a bit to close out the beat. Almost time to close out the beat from 12th Man Studios. Earlier, Gary Blair joined us. He and the women's basketball team 12 straight years in the NCAA tournament, they go out to L.A. for rounds one and two. Take a look at the bracket. The Aggies, they draw a pin in the opening round. Always that 5-12 matchup can be a little dangerous. It's tricky, but think about this, too. Penn ranks third nationally in scoring defense. They only allow 51 points per game. Winner of A&M and the Quakers, they get either UCLA or Boise State on Monday. If you get through this pod, it's likely there's a sweet 16 date out there with the mighty Yukon Huskies. 12 straight years of dancing for Gary Blair and the women's basketball team. Good luck to them out in L.A. We'll see you next week on The Beat.